the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad yourself. Good, man. You've been uh, you've been the traveling guy lately. How's that been? It's good. Well, I mean, you know, the traveling is fun. I had a terrible travel experience on, what was that, Monday, trying to get from Chicago to Houston because of storms. Uh, I'm not sure why they let us take off from Chicago, but what should have been like a four or five hour door to door trip turned into like a 12 hour uh, trip because of uh, weather in Houston. So I got to spend some quality time with the tarmac uh, at Oklahoma City Airport for about two and a half hours, three hours. <laughs> uh, they couldn't let us off the plane either because there were no gates because everyone was being rerouted. So, uh, yeah, that was that's my fun travel story for this week. So do, did you have to wear a mask on the plane? Didn't have to, but I did. Okay. What what would you say percentage wise? How many? What percentage of people were wearing the mask? I'd say about fifty percent. Okay, higher than I thought it would be, but yeah, there was there's still plenty of people wearing masks in the airport, uh, at least that I've been between Houston and um, Chicago O'Hare in the last uh, week or so that I was traveling. So, um, I think people at this point have grown comfortable with it. Um, <laughs> at least some people have. Uh, yeah, I won't well, I won't say that I wear mine all the time, but when I was on the plane, I did, especially with, you know, sitting in coach, uh, when you're kind of on top of everybody. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know, I was just United having a stinky plane, but when you sit on the window seat, you get like the, the exhaust vent from like the, the down side of it. And yeah, it was, it was not a pleasant experience. So I'm actually kind of glad I had, had the mask, uh, with the window seat. Well, you can tell Jeff, you're back to commoner status if you're driving, if you're flying, uh, domestic because. I know when you and I were traveling all the time, you're getting upgraded quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, I just can, I can barely picture you in, in, uh, coach class. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's been a while since I've been on the road so much, but I still, I, I, I'm, I'm missing the upgrades by like, you know, one, two or three people, you know, ahead of me. Uh, I did upgrade manually as in I shelled out money to not have that same experience coming home from Houston. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so of course that flight went fine and, uh, you know, kudos to, I guess, United getting there in one piece. Um, so they seem to have trouble though, getting the jet bridge to work because both sides. So after, so part of this was like, okay, I land in Houston on Monday. Um, after it's already been like 10 hours to or 11 hours to like get wherever we're going. And then we pull up to the gate and they can't get the jet bridge to like, stay in position. So that was like another half hour or 40 minutes or so that they're trying to figure that out. And then when I get back to Chicago, <laughs> just a couple of days ago, the exact same thing happened with the jet bridge in, in Chicago. So I don't know if it's just all my karma that I've had relatively good travel with for, for a while, just kind of built up and this was the trip, but I got, I'm going to go to DC in a few weeks and then I'm going to go to San Francisco. So hopefully those are better travel experiences. Yeah, I haven't traveled for business since it's been over two years now, since our last trip to DC. And you and I were supposed to travel to a conference earlier this year, or was it end it was of late last, last year? year. October late, 2021. Yeah. And I wound up coming down with, you know, what I thought might be COVID. It wasn't COVID. Uh, but anyway, too sick to travel. And I haven't traveled for business this year. And I am um I'm hoping that picks back up uh i've got i'm like right on the precipice of platinum status with delta so a couple trips this year and i'll be good going into next year and i think i think platinum's kind of the breaking point where you wind up getting upgraded most of the time as long as you're not flying to somewhere really desirable like you know las vegas or cross-country flight might be different for delta i mean i'm platinum on united and that has not been my experience but I've also been going to pretty busy places, so I guess we'll see. Yeah. So, I mean, conference season is starting to kick back up. This will be, you know, one of our topics for today. Um, I'm hoping to hit a few conferences this year, but it's like, you know, there, there's such a great smorgasbord of conferences out there. You know, you got the Gardner IM Summit, which 
you know, coming up for me was always kind of like the Uber event of the year for identity and access management conferences. But I think there are some great contenders now. There's Identiverse, which I think some folks would make the argument that it's, you know, the more important uh, singular uh, conference event for IAM. Uh, I've never been to Identiverse. Uh, there's RSA, which is more infosec wide. Um, there's the Kupinger Coal. So if you're in Europe, there's probably a whole other slate, but I'm certainly aware of the Kupinger Coal EIC European Identity Conference. There's Authenticate, uh, the FIDO Conference, and then there are a lot of vendors specific conferences. So Okta, Bordrock, SailPoint, you know, you name it, Ping. They've all they've all got their own conferences. Or actually, Ping might just do Identiverse. I think Identiverse was originally the Ping conference. So um, you've been to basically all of those except maybe the Kupinger Coal Conference. We we've been together to a Kupinger Coal Conference in Seattle a couple of years back. Um, but kind of what's your impression of each one of those? Maybe start with the Gartner IM Summit. Yeah, I think um, Gartner is a good one. I, I enjoy it. I think it's more focused on like the business side of identity and access management. So I think there's certainly value there. I have, you know, historically, it's been a little bit vanilla. But I've noticed, at least pre-pandemic, I've not been to one <laughs> uh, during or, or post-pandemic at this point. I'm hopefully make it out later this year. I have noticed in more recent events that they have started to add a little more technical tracks to some of the some of the uh, tracks specifically at Gartner. So I think that's a good. I think there's still value in going to it. Um, it's in Vegas, I believe. It's usually like right after Thanksgiving in the U.S., so like the first week of December but they've moved it up to August, I believe, for this year. So August in Las Vegas, is you're probably going to stay inside <laughs> uh, or you're burned to a crisp uh, if you're like me with your with my my play, my pale complexion. Uh, but that's a good one. Um, so I, I'm planning a hit on that one. Yeah, real quick on that one. So um, my thought always was if you are, you know, maybe you've been in the business world for, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it is, but you're new to IAM. I think a lot of our listeners kind of fall into this space where, you know, they've been doing project management or IT or information security, and now they're picking up this new area of identity and access management. I think this is one of the best conferences to go to, to really educate yourself on what is identity governance and administration? What is access management? You know, learn more about multi-factor authentication, privilege access management, how to run a good IAM program. So I think those are great things. I think if you are, you have been in the IAM space for a long time, from a networking perspective, seeing some of the old faces, usually, quote unquote, everybody's there. Um, and also great vendor hall at the Gartner Summit. I think it's usually at Caesars. Do you know if this year, if it's at Caesars? Yeah, I think so. I have to look and see, but I'm pretty sure it's at Caesars again. Yeah, uh, they have a really good um, conference set up there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think the way Gartner does it, right? They have the IM Summit, but they have a lot of conferences and I think they run them all at Caesars and kind of back to back weeks. So they don't have to like completely reconstruct the whole area as they go from conference to conference. I don't know that factually, but that's always been my impression. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's, I don't even know if that fact is correct, but it, it would certainly make a good idea. Um, they do run a good conference. They know what they're doing. They have certainly been doing this for a while, so it makes sense. Uh, it's a good conference. You know, I think you tend to see more of like the C-suite and executives at those conferences. Conversely, something like Identiverse, which personally I think has become the best identity conference in the space for people who are in this field. Um, it did start off as a, as kind of like the ping identity conference, but they've done a really good job of sort of making a little more neutral. It is still a ping conference, but there is tons of identity related stuff going on. It's the home conference for ID pro, uh, which I'm a fan of. Um, and it's a great networking experience and it's definitely more technical in nature for some of the, some of the contents out there. It's not all technical. So if you're just getting into identity, that could be a good one as well, but um, I, I like the way Identiverse kind of runs its stuff and Ping does a good job of 
not slapping their logo on every single thing <laughs> about it, which, which I appreciate, which I'm sure you appreciate as well as we don't do it here either on our, on our show. Uh, so Identiverse is a good one. Yeah. I thought in terms of one thing that I've, again, I've not been to Identiverse, but I usually watch whatever becomes available, you know, for non-attendees to watch in terms of the sessions. Um, the presenters at Identiverse are some of the famous people in IEM. You know, a lot of the folks that we've had on our show, Ian Glazers of the world, Eve Mailers of the world. Um, I think the, you know, on the Gartner IEM Summit side, you get the Gartner analysts. Uh, you also get uh, folks from the key sponsors of the conference. So not to say that those people don't do a great job of presenting, they do, uh, but just that's the kind of the compare and contrast. I think that on the Identiverse side, you get kind of the the field of people within um, the space that you may or may not know those folks, but they've generally been in the space for a long time. Yeah, good, smart people. I think, I, I think if I were gonna compare like Gartner and Identiverse, I feel like there's more passion for identity at Identiverse. Not that there isn't good things to be had out of, you know, the Gartner side of it, because there's certainly value there too. But I feel like the people who are going to it are passionate. They're dedicated to identity. And, you know, it's a good one. I'm, 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 I'm not going to shill it for it anymore because I think it's a great conference. Go check it out. It's at the end of June. I am not sure if I'm going to make it this year. This might be one that I end up skipping just because of all everything that's going on uh, personally and professionally. But uh, if I can make it, I'll make it. Otherwise, uh, I might have to skip this year. Um, I am going to be at RSA, um, planning on being there in a few weeks. That is, uh, let's see, like kind of the first full week of June. Um, that is definitely more broadly InfoSec is kind of, you were talking about, um, I like going to those conferences because that is just a massive vendor hall. In fact, this year, that's the only thing I'm going to be doing is just going through the vendor hall, not even attending any sessions. Um, it is really cheap to do that. It's like 50 bucks <laughs> to go to the vendor hall. Uh, of course, the hotel situation in San Francisco is absolutely crazy. Um, I think the record is, I think I once spent $900 a night for a hotel in downtown um, San Francisco, which is, that's somebody's rent <laughs> for an entire month. Um, but that's what happens when you wait to the last minute. So if you haven't gotten a hotel already, you're probably going to be staying in like San Jose uh, or, you know, somewhere north of the bridge and kind of commuting in for it. Uh, but I, I do like that conference. That seems like still like the main one that most InfoSec vendors going to. Identity is certainly a big part of that. So I'll be kind of walking the halls there. If, if you're listening to this and uh, you want to do a fist bump or whatever the uh, the uh, appropriate greeting is of the day, uh, you know, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to to, to try and find a spot where you can uh, can do that and just chat. Um, so that's RSA. I've never been to Kubernetes Cole's EIC. I think that's kind of next on the the hit list for me is to see if I can make it to that at some point. Um, I know that that's typically in Europe, which is a little bit longer travel for me uh, to get there, but I'd like to hit that. Um, we did hit Authenticate, uh, at least I did last year. Uh, that's one we did. I like that one. It was actually, it's a very technical conference for the most part. So people kind of listening through that. If you're, if you're more focused on the authentication side of identity, um, then certainly Authenticate is where I would you know, spend some time at. It's a good conference that the Fido Alliance is, is starting to put together there. That's in Seattle, I think, later this year. I want to say it's in October. That's one that I think we'll try to hit as well. Yeah, and then, as I mentioned, there's the vendor-specific conference. So, um, SailPoint has one called Navigate. Okta has one called Octane. Um, Microsoft has one. And I can't remember the name of the Microsoft They have like one, eight but... of them, like Build and Ignite and, you know, other yeah. cool verbs. <laughs> Yeah, they're cool firms, exactly. So um, let's talk strategy for a second. If you were to kind of fit that that mold I talked about earlier of somebody who is now, you know, you've got some professional experience under your belt. You've been in the workforce and in, in, in some kind of technology job, maybe a leadership role for about 10 years, but you're new to identity and access management. You can go to one conference. Or maybe you can go to one conference plus one. Where do you spend so your two? money? <laughs> yeah, yeah. One plus one is two, right? But Nobody told I, us heavy math on is, this show. I mean, I get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't get into heavy math. But I guess where I'm going with that is like, you can definitely do one. 
maybe you can do another one. Maybe you could do two more if like you really have a strong business case. So that second one is a little bit uh, gray zone. Yeah, I think if you are, so using that profile, right? Somebody who's sort of just getting into identity. I think it's a toss up between Gartner and Identiverse. And it's really is what is it you are personally trying to get out of it? If you want to understand like more the business side of identity and access management, I think Gartner is probably the better fit. And I just say that because it's really more on program development, what's coming up, um, you know, what are the trends and research they're seeing? And Gartner's a huge research company and they certainly put out, you know, their magic quadrants and buyer's guides and things like that that are very valuable as a starting point to have conversations with. Should not be the end point um, because every, you know, company may be a little bit different in what they're looking for. I, if you are more of a practitioner and you're like in the weeds and you're doing identity work, maybe you are somebody who's responsible for the Okta environment or uh, sale points. Uh, maybe maybe not Okta for Identiverse, maybe like Ping, <laughs> uh, since technically it would be competitors. But even if I was, if you're like in that authentication side of things or maybe authorization um, or even just like lifecycle management, I think Identiverse is probably where I would go. So it really just kind of depends. Like, you know, are you more overseeing a group and management of like I am, or are you technical? That's the, probably the bifurcation that I would put in place to see which I preferred. If you could do both, great. Those are the two that I would hit. I think RSA is kind of like added value. You know, you kind of just go to the vendor hall and maybe, and, and maybe there's other stuff that you kind of get broader from an InfoSec. Um, Authenticate's another great one, but that's very specific to authentication. So that's why I think I put Identiverse just above it because we're the profile we're talking about is sort of that general identity practitioner and what is it we're going to get out of it. All right. Now I'm going to take the constraint off. I'm going to add something new. So now you're the newly anointed IEM program manager. You have a team and you have no budget constraint in terms of which conference you can, conferences you can go to and you can bring your team to, but you still have to get your job done, right? So it's not like, hey, we just <laughs> stop working and just go to conferences. Wouldn't that be fun? That'd be um, awesome. Yeah. If you, if you want to do that, you should get a job in marketing because that's a lot of times they just go from conference to conference. But, you know, assuming there's no, um, you know, budget restraint, uh, would you still go to Gartner? And I would you go to Gartner and Identiverse then? Or would you still kind of pick and choose one? because you're not going to, you know, double up in value. I would go to all of these. If I had, if I had the time and the budget to do everything, I would go to RSA in the spring. I would go to Identiverse in the summer. I would go to Gartner in the fall or winter. I'm not sure which season they're going to stay with at this point. I would try to hit, uh, you know, for me being in the U.S., going to Europe is a little bit tougher from a timing perspective, but I would cert I would love to go to like, you know, the European Identity Conference for, for KC. And maybe that's an alternate, you know, for people who are looking for that kind of thing. I think that would be a great one to hit. Um, you know, authenticates in the fall too. I would go to any conference that I think gives me an opportunity to meet people, learn what's going on in the industry and learn what's coming up from a trends and what are people thinking about? I think that's really the value. The biggest value to too is getting into that networking mode and having those hallway conversations. Yeah, I think I, I, I've talked about it in previous episodes, but you know, me talking, you know, quantum cryptography with Roger Grimes at Authenticate last year was awesome. It was just a 45 minute thing that we had standing at like, you know, those little standing tables and we're just kind of going back and forth. And he was gracious with his time. And I was asking probably like basic questions, but I learned a lot just from that 45 minute conversation. Was it a tract? that was on the, you know, the schedule? Absolutely not. It was just something that, you know, organically happened as we were kind of sitting there and it's like, hey, you know, thanks for being on the show and stuff like that. I've talked about that experience and one thing led to another. And, you know, now I'm a quantum expert is, is the way I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, total expert. Yeah. Uh, and, and the world gets to benefit from that. But no, I mean, you make yourself a better IM consultant for sure, or if you're a program manager, whatever role you play in the IM world. Uh, you're a better practitioner of that. Yeah, I think so. I think you have to really understand what, what is you want to get out of it. I think sometimes there's also the perception that, oh, it's just a vacation, right? I get to go to a cool city and you know, that's it. 
if that's what your if that's what your intention is, then you're not gonna you're not getting better, <laughs> right? It's a vacation, and you're basically kind of cheating yourself out of the opportunity to learn more in the identity space. And hey, if that's what you want to do, cool. But for me, it's, it's not a vacation. There are long days because work has to get done regardless of whether you know you're at a conference or not. So you have to kind of plan around it. And and uh, you know, I I treat it as an opportunity to continue to educate get smarter, know what's going on in the space, things like that. Well, you really bring up an interesting point there. So if you're the manager of a team, maybe you can just, you can't go to the conference yourself. Maybe you're sending a couple of your team members. What's your expectation for them to do their day job while there's a conference going on? Because I think the worst case scenario is you're spending, let's say the 900 bucks a night, you know, let's pick scale it back to yeah. more realistic but you know you're spending a thousand dollars a day to have somebody there when you all in on a travel and conference pass and all that and then they're just working on their day job all day and not paying attention to the conference skipping sessions you know yeah. not enjoying themselves i think you have to you, you've got to if you're going to send somebody to a conference dedicate let them dedicate their time to that don't plan on, you know, trying to split, you know, someone who's responsible for, you know, provisioning accounts and have them doing that their day and then go to a conference at night. That's not how it works. The conference taking place during the day. <laughs> um, and if they're constantly getting, you know, dinged on teams or other types of communications to like to do stuff, they're not getting any value out of it. So I would, you know, if you're a manager and you're sending someone out there, let them go. Let them, you know, if, if you're so single threaded that you cannot survive because so-and-so is out of the office, take a look at your organization and figure out how you're going to get past that because that's just a conference. What happens if, you know, they're sick, they find another job, they win the lottery, they get tired of the work-life balance, <laughs> right? Whatever it may be, you know, you've got to figure out ways to allow people on your team to grow. Um, I know it could be tough sometimes from a budgeting standpoint and kind of scheduling, but you're making the investment in the individual. I think they're incumbent on the individual on, in, on the individual to take advantage of that and do the right thing, go to the conference, learn something, bring back maybe that information to the team. But I think it's also incumbent on the company that's investing in the individual to let the person go. Don't be up in their hair all the time. <laughs> you know, let, well, them, think, let them enjoy the conference and learn. I think you made a point like, okay, it's not just a vacation, but at the same time, it is a reward or it is... Yeah. An incentive to work here. If it becomes, hey, you get to go somewhere and do your job there and, and try to, you know, do this conference, but not really, you, you've taken a big part of away from, from it being a reward for doing a good job and working here. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. I mean, it's something that I'm working on right now and kind of like my new role is kind of figure out budgets are not unlimited, right? And I, I'd love to send everybody to every conference, but work's got to get done too. And, you know, sometimes there is a little bit of a ramp up where it's like, okay, you know, it might be seen as a reward. Some people like doing that. Some people don't. So, and that's fine too, right? If you don't like going to conferences, I'm not going to send somebody there. It's like, I hate it. <laughs> that's, that's more of a punishment. Like, what did I do wrong that you're sending me out to this conference? Um you know, I think, I, I think you're totally right though. It's, it, 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 is, it is a benefit if you're being sent to one, if you want to take advantage of it, great. That's it. I also think there's a potential option where we're in this virtual work world where we don't all go into the same office like we maybe had done in past years. Um, potentially if a large portion of the team is going to something like Identiverse or Gartner, having an opportunity for people to meet in person. Because I know for a lot of the years of working with Identropy and, you know, Productivity, I've not had the opportunity to meet very many people face to face. Yeah. I think having that, you know, it's a great spot to like, get together, right? Even if it's just a handful of people. I certainly enjoyed it with the Identropy days. I, I, you know, I worked for Pertivity for a year and three months and never went to a Pertivity office. I never met anybody face to face from Pertivity. I mean, I knew the identity people, obviously, and you and I right. talked all the time. <laughs> so there, there's that. But 
if you can, if you can figure out how to make it a team building exercise and you can afford to have, you know, three, four people, even two people who just normally don't, you know, interact on a daily basis in person, why not? It's a great, it's a great opportunity to do that. So if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of shift our conversation away from conferences. The boring um, conferences. Move on. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Enough on conferences, dang it. Um, yeah, no. So just, you know, going through LinkedIn, uh, there's just been more and more people posting really good content. Um, Martin Kupinger has been posting a lot of videos lately. Um, and the one that he posted today, I thought he brought up a really interesting topic, which was talking about this place in between uh, workforce IAM and customer IAM, which is essentially what he was calling like um, partner IAM. And I'll reframe it and just call it business to business, which you could look at it as kind of workforce or you could look at it as customer. It's really straddling the line between the two. Um, a lot of challenges related to that that are different than workforce. I think the, you know, for, for this is, we're going to break away from the video and kind of add my own thoughts on it. I think the biggest thing is, you know, especially when you're looking at workforce, you've got authoritative sources of information. So essentially telling you the who of who works here. I think when people think about these partnership relationships also, you know, you start saying, well, don't we have a vendor management team? Don't we have somebody on the finance side, who's managing that authoritative source of these these vendors, if you will, and what I find is generally they're those are managed at the contract level, not at the identity level. So you don't have an authoritative source. So ultimately, you have to kind of come up with some way to manage static identities or having to work with partners where they're kind of bringing their own identities. But ultimately, I think that's one of the biggest challenges how it splits away from from workforce. Do you have any any thoughts specific to this space, this B two B challenge? Well, yeah, it's definitely one of the um, one of the areas that you know you and I have seen over the years that just isn't well managed. Companies do a good job managing their employees, and they put them into an HR platform. Everything's nice. And then all the non employees, I think of contractors, vendors, partners, you know stuff like that, this kind of white space in between employee and customer is typically not very well managed. I've seen some changes though. I think over the last couple of years, we've seen more, um, more awareness that it's an issue and putting them into sort of a, some sort of system, but it's still a problem. And we, we've certainly seen vendors in this space, you know, one that you and I, um, look at quite a bit is sex data and kind of the space they're filling is kind of like this third party risk area, but it goes back to really the, the crux of identity and access management. And that's who has access to what. If you don't know all the who's, <laughs> then you have a gap. Um, so, you know, this is soapbox time. If you're out there and you're running an IAM program or a business and you're listening to this episode, do you know who has access to what? Can you, ask, can you answer that question accurately for all of the users who have access to your environment? Not just employees, vendors, partners, you know, whatever it might be, you know, integrators, whatever you call them you know, in your space, do you have an authoritative source for them? And are they well-managed? You can't answer that question you know, in the affirmative. You got to start working on that problem because that's, that's what we're seeing now more, especially in like ransomware supply chain attacks where they're going after, you know, vendor accounts and things like that. Your employees are well secured. And you know, we saw it earlier this year with Okta, you know, one of their integrators got breached for 20 minutes and Look at all the heartburn that caused, <laughs> you know, for, for Okta itself. Um, so, you know, think about it from that perspective, from the risk perspective, you know, what's, who is more transient from a, uh, identity perspective, it's probably going to be your more ephemeral workforce, which is your contractors, your partners, your vendors, you know, less likely to be an employee that you're putting some trust in, not saying you don't put security around them, but it still baffles me when I see the risk associated with third parties and they still kind of get treated separately and not as well from an identity perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, uh, this whole B2C, B2B space becomes so complex because there's so many different use cases that make up 
the B2B space, whether they're vendors, partners, uh, customers, uh, franchisees, agencies, you name it. Uh, but essentially you're doing business with another business that they're doing services for you or they are your customers, but they're not, you know, this entity isn't what's transacting the business. It's an individual, it's an identity, it's a person or even a machine account. But let's keep it simple for now. It's a human being that works for this third party that has to transact business. And usually it's not a one for one relationship. It's not like you have this business relationship and they only have one person who can access your system. Typically it's multiple people. So then you have all these different use cases around well, who's going to be the administrator from that side. Can they create access for other people? Are there multiple levels of access? What if they have a hierarchy within their organization? So I'm doing business with another business and that business has multiple sub businesses under it. Now, how do I handle that complexity? And so you mentioned six data, uh, they, they really specialize in that area. There are a few others like field glass, Covacent. There's one that's looking at called, uh, my Uh, it looks like a cloud-based service, but you know, just talking with the folks over at six data. I think that, you know, they're really trying to tackle this problem. I know that they're working with another company that I've worked with as a client on um, tackling it from a franchisee side. Franchisee is a, a major use case within this business partner relationship environment. Um, and I think that if they solve it for the franchisee side, it could be, you know, a lot of that could be leveraged in an agency scenario. So as they build out their support for use cases, those use cases can probably be extended um, to, you know, meet other organizations' needs and demands. So, um, but I, I think the ultimate takeaway is like the, the biggest challenge with this, like when you look at Workforce IEM, there are major platforms like SailPoint and Savient and all the other IGA vendors who, you know, they've, they've kind of solved all the major use cases. Like you put your identities in an authoritative source, you manage the who there, and then you do access requests here, you do your access governance here, and you provision out from your IGA platform. So it's kind of like, for the most part, the problem has been solved. When you look at the B2C side, a little bit less so, but when you're talking about just like an e-commerce platform or business to individual B to B to C scenario, um, it's much more straightforward. And and those basic identity workflows like registration, profile management have been solved within products. So Fordrock, Auth0, all those major platforms, Salesforce, they've kind of got those baked in and solved. It's this B two B where there really hasn't been a product solution that you can kind of just say that's the go-to. Um, from an authentication side, you can leverage those same authentication tools they use for B2C, you know, to to validate that who's logging in is actually who they say they are, to perform auth authorization, things like that. But in terms of the identity management side and even more complicated delegated identity management, that's just a piece that really hasn't been solved well. And I've always felt like it's a huge area if somebody would go after it. And I, I think six, it is going after it. Uh, but I, you know, I think that is a space that continues to evolve. Yeah. I mean, we're really talking about really more of like the people and the process side of things of managing these types of identities. Um, and certainly sex at there's field glasses on the one that I've seen your, the use cases are, I feel like pretty much the same, not the same, but you know, 75, 80% are probably pretty consistent across. It's still onboarding. It's still offboarding. It's still changes that might happen at identity level, right? I work on one team and maybe now I work on a different team or report to a different manager or things like that. The workflows are, are really the, are, have been, I think, historically the problem here. It's the process stinks because it just goes into like a spreadsheet 
or an access database. And now you've got some dedicated systems that sure cost money to kind of address that. And you're up against it. Well, it just works. Yeah, it's because, you know, I don't know, Caroline is out there working inside of a, you know, spreadsheet and keeping track of it manually. You've got these little I am heroes running around, you know, that are hiding the problems of the of the lack of a good process around these types of individuals, these types of identities. Usually there is a clear owner of, okay, well, who owns the employee identity population? You know, you ask who the same thing is, well, who owns partners and vendors and consultants? Nobody. It's pretty rare still at this point. And because there is no ownership of it, there is no process and there's no standard way to do it. So you have like, a, you know, 80 different ways to onboard uh, a consultant or a contractor or a partner or whatever, you know, business partner, whatever it might look like. And then you get into the, the details of like, well, how are we going to manage these? Is it going to be a manual effort? We've got to go out and build out identities in our own environment to do that. Okay. Well, we know that Jim's going to come in and, and run an advisory engagement and we're going to give him an AD account and access to SharePoint and things like that. You know, there's overhead that comes along with that. Do you allow maybe BYOID, which, you know, bring your own identity federation, you know, can you federate with, you know, the Microsoft, you know, 365 tenant and let somebody come in and then give them appropriate permissions. I think you and I have seen that in the past, like, you know, organizations struggle just sharing <laughs> between each other sometimes, you know, from a document perspective, because of all the security controls, concerns around data proliferation. Um, yeah, I love you know, what are your the- thoughts on that one? I love the federation. I love the the problem that it solves, which is, you know, you can set up the best IAM system for managing partner identities and it becomes ineffective if the partner's not doing a good job of managing their identities. So say you have a partner and somebody within that partner has been assigned the responsibility to make sure that the hundred people that work there that need access to your systems are maintained. Well, they go ahead and have somebody leave the company and that person forgets to shut them off in your system, then that account remains active even after the person left. And what's really bad without that federation model is they could just log in from home. Maybe they went to work for a competitor and now they're accessing your system and pulling all that data down. And that can all happen in you know one night. Um, with a federation model, you could be pretty darn sure that your partner is going to shut them off from their corporate network. If they shut them off from their corporate network, they no longer have access to the identity provider that provides them the single sign-on to federate into your system. So that's the huge advantage. The big disadvantage of that model is it requires a certain level of complexity. You have to be working with a business partner who has an IDP that is willing to put the effort into federating to your system. Big companies generally can do it. Um, Small to mid-sized companies may or may not be able to do it and may just not have the interest in doing it. So um, if you have a small number of big clients or small number of big partners that you need to federate with, that's a model where federation may work when you have a lot a lot of client are a lot of partners, uh, or they are small. It probably doesn't work as well, but I also think that you don't, it's not, um, uh, black or white. You could do federation for some of your, uh, partners and not for others. You just really have to kind of take that strategic approach and that's where it's going to look, where it's going to come down to the details. So let me ask you a question, put your prognosticator hat on. Is, I feel like what we're describing here is a legacy identity and access management problem. The reason I say that is because more and more companies are moving to the cloud. They no longer have the on-prem active directories or, you know, those kinds of authentication sources. And they're moving more to Azure or AWS or GCP or any of these other, you know, Okta, Universal Directory or Ping Directory, whatever it may be, which theoretically makes it easier to perform these trusts, right, from a federation standpoint, from authentication or even social login, whatever it might look like. What does this look like in, let's say, five years? Give me give me a Jimmy Mac IAM prediction for, you know, the cross pollination of identity across organizations where federation is the norm 
Or do you still think, yeah, we've got a long way to go still, and uh, it's going to be more of a challenge? I think it's more of the latter. I think it's still going to be a challenge. I think more companies will have the technical wherewithal to solve the problem. But I still think it's going to come down to, we only have so many hours to invest in doing things. So, um, you know, doing this IT work, these performing these integrations. So if it's a very important integration to federate with your system, companies will put the time in to federate to your system um, because they will have the technical wherewithal. Uh, however, it's kind of that same scenario I was talking about. If you have like thousands of partners that you have to integrate, it's probably not going to be technically feasible. I think you're right. This is a legacy IAM problem from the standpoint of this has been the problem for the past 10, 15, 20 years where federation has been a capability and, you know, if you have very large, sophisticated partners that you want to federate with, setting up an identity SAML federation or um, OAuth2 federation is feasible to perform. When you get to many companies or less technically sophisticated, I think what you're pointing out is that they may be less technically sophisticated, but they're just going to be forced down a path and they're going to have this capability. The question is like, yeah, even if they have the capability, will they know how to use it? Uh, the second thing is, you know, are they going to put in the effort to build the federation? Because that is what's going to be required. And if you're a really small organization, you probably don't have an IT person on staff. So that means you have to pay your consultant to build the integration. Now, let's say, yeah, I can, you know, my IT person will build the integration for $500. How much work are you doing? Yes. Is it worth it? It may not. It may not be. And maybe there's a way to make this more self-service and kind of dynamically API based, right? I'm, I'm sure, I don't think technically it's a lot of work. I think it's usually more political than anything, uh, unfortunately, but yeah, you're right. Not having infrastructure. Um, okay. Well, you heard it here first. So, uh, Federation is going to be, is never going, is never, is never coming to any of us. We're going to continue to live in silos of identity. And, you know, Jimmy Mac has spoken and thus it will be. <laughs> well, you know what? And, and passwords aren't going away overnight either. Yeah. Well, we've been hearing that for a very, very long time. It's funny, you know, but we're recording this on a Friday. This is going to go live hopefully on Monday if I can get it edited in time, but it'll already be May. I feel like this year has passed by so quickly already. Um, it'll be May and then next. So next it'll be May 2nd when this goes out. And May 5th is World Password Day. Did you know that? I knew that May 5th was Cinco de Mayo and you should have a margarita. Absolutely. You should celebrate. I am a, I'm a fan. Uh, chips, salsa, margaritas, uh, you know, Wait, celebrate I everything. you're a queso guy. Oh, of course, queso. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's strictly Mexican invention or if it's <laughs> like, you know, something <laughs> bastardized it somehow by adding a whole bunch of cheese to something. But yes, I am a... A queso connoisseur for sure. Yeah. It's kind of like um, something on the, the Chinese food menu that people told me is it's not Chinese food. That's like, I don't know, probably like sweet and sour chicken or something like that. It's like, that's not real Chinese food, man. That's uh, <laughs> American Chinese food. Yeah. I so guess I don't want to kind of fits into that. Yeah. I don't, I want to make sure I don't offend. I don't have the whole history behind it, but I enjoy it all. Um, well, melted cheese. So yeah, I mean, who would be offended by that? It's totally healthy. Yeah, you'll be fine with it. Um, so World Password Day is May 5th. Uh, we'll focus on, you know, the lesser known, probably the two holidays. Um, I certainly have thoughts about this. What are your thoughts on World Password Day? Well, I I feel like we're kind of, um, I, we're, mentally all kind of like, all right, we're at the sunset of the password. But I also feel like here on the Identity at the Center podcast, we need to continually remind ourselves to not just uh, take our United States, you know, perspective or our Western perspective and just say, this is the way it is worldwide. I mean, 
The reason that the password has become so popular is it's universally um, adoptable worldwide. So if you can get to a computer that has a keyboard and has a screen, it can pull up a, an application, you have the input device to authenticate yourself by typing in a shared secret or a password, right? You don't have to use a biometric. You don't have to get a factor sent to your device that is something other than the computer. So that's the benefit. And how do those two things come together? Well, I think there are places in the world where, you know, people still go to internet cafes um, and are using a computer that's not theirs. They may or may not have a cell phone or the cell phone may not have the sophistication to use a biometric. So I think we're going to be celebrating World Password Day for quite a while. And I guess that's the perspective that I wanted to bring. I hate it. That's my opinion. <laughs> I think it's stupid. We're celebrating something that nobody likes. I mean, this is like we're gluttons for punishment. I get why it's there. It, you know, it's supposed to drive like awareness or something, but um, I think it's just dumb. I don't. That's my personal opinion. You went way more philosophical uh, than I did on it uh, with, uh, you know, the deepness. Me, I just think it's stupid. Why would we celebrate something that nobody likes? You know, let's just get rid of the password. But you bring up some very valid points. It's not for everybody yet. So I unfortunately think that we'll be celebrating password day. Uh, or at least marking it, observing it, maybe not celebrating is the right, probably not the right word. Uh, but I just think it's, I think it's dumb. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw any of my weight or support behind it. <laughs> what if it became a day off from work? Okay, now we're talking. Now it might become one of my favorite holidays. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a holiday of for nothing. Right, yeah. It exactly. kind of sounds like a Seinfeld episode. Well, if the whole point behind password day is like drive awareness and like, you know, tell people, well, you really should change your password, you know, on some sort of rotated schedule, which NIST and Microsoft and others over the last couple of years said, no, you shouldn't do that. It might take you an entire day to go through all of your accounts and change all of your passwords. Um, you know, I'm guessing, I don't know how many we have. I know I have at least a few hundred accounts in my password manager. If I had to go and change every single account, that would take me at least a day. And I would certainly expect that that I would not be doing any other work other than that. So there, there must be some holiday that you do enjoy, though. Anything revolving food. Thanksgiving, Christmas, Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I uh, am I'm a equal opportunity uh, holiday celebrator, especially if it's one that has a day off from work. Those are my favorite ones. So... Thanksgiving, most people have turkey. Uh, most people in the U.S. have turkey, mashed potatoes. I guess it's a U.S. holiday, but I think a lot of countries have some kind of uh, Thanksgiving equivalent, right? Um, I'm not sure. When I was growing up, you know, it, for we had Christmas would be the same meal as Thanksgiving, and then New Year's would be ham, mashed potatoes, things like that, and then we would do St. Patrick's. Because I'm Irish and we would have corned beef and um, actually corned beef and sauerkraut, which I don't think is maybe that was just the German influence <laughs> that found its way in. It's corned beef and sauerkraut would go really good together. Does it? I can't. Yeah. I, 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 I can say neither are, are, are favorites or things that I would actively seek out. So I'll, I'll just nod and say, okay. Cool. You do you, Jimmy. <laughs> you do you. Uh, yeah. So which, which is, uh, your favorite holiday meal? Um, it's tough to argue against Thanksgiving just for the sheer quantity. That being said, I typically don't eat a lot on holidays. I don't, it's, it's not like I go and gorge myself on those days. Like it's, I, it's a normal day for me. It's more about getting together with friends and family and just kind of relaxing and chilling out. The food is sort of like secondary, but I think just the availability typically associated with Thanksgiving holiday means that there's generally more types of food around. So I'm more of a snacker. So let's, uh, so I'll go with that just for that reason alone. So, yeah, I mean, I love Thanksgiving. I would I remember being a kid and eating three plates of Thanksgiving food 
and laying down to watch, laying down on the carpet to watch the NFL football games that would always be on Thanksgiving Day and being so stuffed that I was actually in pain. I'd be like <laughs> <laughs> writhing in pain on the memory. floor. <laughs> it is, well, I did a year after year after year. It's just, yeah, I enjoyed it. But it's, it's interesting as we're talking about this, and I was thinking about the different food associated with different holidays. I thought of Halloween. Halloween, for those candy. who don't know, in the United States, is you go from door to door and ask for candy. And you say trick or treat, and people give you candy. Um, I loved candy growing up. And I remember one time, like, I guess I was the, the best behaved kid in school. I was always very fidgety, right? I couldn't sit still in my in my chair. And I remember I was at a parent teacher conference. I was there with my dad. And um, the teacher's like, you know, you know, Jimmy doesn't sit still in my class. And I have a feeling I know why. And my dad said, why? And the teacher led us back to my desk and opened the desk. And there are all these candy wrappers. <laughs> <laughs> my dad still tells that story to this day. Like yeah. you're hoarding, like, yeah, I see like just, I, so what was the candy then? Was it like chocolate? Like, oh yeah, yeah. I'm definitely a chocolate guy. I mean, yeah. like, um, peanut butter cups, Snickers bars. Those are, those are definitely my top two, but I mean, I, I don't discriminate. I'll even eat like, you know, mounds and you, oh, know, you can put anything. Yeah. You can put anything gross. in chocolate. It tastes good. No, I, I want to believe that, but. Uh, no, <laughs> just this. All right, Jeff. So, what are you, what are your top three candies? That's that's a good. Oh, definitely good Snickers. ending. Snickers okay. bar is is definitely up there. I like a good Twix. Um, I think, and then you know what? Just a really good Hershey bar with almonds. Just melt chocolate and almonds. I can get behind that. I like that you? too. That's yeah. actually one of my favorites. Yeah, Snickers, peanut butter cups, and Heath, or any. You know, he, Heath is like the, that toffee with chocolate. I mean, I think there are a couple different brands that any of those, like score, any of those would do it for me. You know, basically I had a lot of cavities as a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds like it. Um, yeah. okay. So now I'm hungry and it's, it's getting into the evening on a Friday night and I need time to get this out. So what's, why don't we call it there now that you've learned our favorite candies? I'd love to hear what other people's favorite candies are. So, or, you know, if you just want to send me gifts of like Snickers bars to LinkedIn, that's cool too. I'm sure Jim will like that as well. Um, what do we want to call this show? Cause I, we, we started off with conferences and then we started talking about like this white space of identity in between employee and customer and then my my dissatisfaction with the celebration of password day and then candy what do we call this episode um i don't know i mean i feel like we kind of it, everything blended from one conversation to the next start talking about travel and i think it's it's time to hit the road again so maybe something on that theme but you're the the, you're the master at figuring out names for episodes. Um, All right. So you're like Brock me. the Casbah right. last time. Yeah. Last, yeah. If you didn't catch last week's episode, um, I, I promised Jim that I would isolate him singing and I put it at the front of the, of the podcast. I put it at the end of the podcast and I turned it into our little promo clip that we did. So uh, if you haven't checked that out, um, go listen to, to Jimmy singing the hits. <laughs> It was like, I, I, I got a good reaction. I got several texts and LinkedIn messages on that one. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's the secret. That's how we unlock even more listeners is we turn this into a musical. <laughs> I, I will say this. I just want to make the comment to everybody who's listened to, um, reaches out. I appreciate you guys so much. Just getting those notes that you enjoy the podcast and enjoy what Jeff and I are doing. Um, it means so much. It makes us feel like what we're doing actually is, you know, makes a difference and is worth putting in the time and effort for. So thank you. You giving that back to us makes it worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. It is very cool. I, I it's, it, it's not lost. I mean, it's certainly appreciated. And, you know, if you're going to be at a conference, if you're going to be at RSA, seriously, you know, let me know on LinkedIn. I'd love to, you know, 
say hi and find out what you're up to and kind of learn more about what you're working on and, and be part of the community. So, um, don't hesitate to do that. And if you're going to another conference, you know, let us know what we're, Jim and I are always happy to, to, uh, bump fists and just have a chat and, uh, you know, we, we put on our, our gold and diamond pants, just like everyone else. So, um, <laughs> you know, hopefully that makes sense. Um, then we make gold records. Then we make gold records. We make, we make gold podcasts. How about that? Um, all right, let's go ahead and wrap it up for this week. You and I were talking before the show, like, oh, I was coming with a short one. Here we are. I'm staring at 55 minutes on the clock. So, uh, that's probably a good one for us to, to leave on. Um, our weekly live stream is still on hiatus while I'm figuring out my work schedule and travel and stuff like that, but we'll return to a YouTube channel uh, near you soon. The replays out there from the ones we've done, I think we've got 15 of them are at IDAC.live. We're on the web by Denny at the center.com. We're on Twitter at IDAC podcast. And uh, assuming that Twitter still survives the Elon op- 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 apocalypse, uh, we'll continue to be on there as well. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and leave it for this week. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll talk with you all in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.